So last week I talked about what to do when you get triggered and summarized some first aid in the moment, in the heat of the moment, right in the thick of things, what we can do ourselves to manage our reactions, not pour gasoline on the fire, and have compassion and respect for ourselves, and also be engaged in a learning process and, and cope in a way that's effective and resilient with you know, whatever has triggered us. That was a very provocative topic and got a lot of good feedback from a lot of different people. So how about when they're triggered? <laughs> you know, including what do we do when maybe they're triggered about us? What do we do? So as I warned you, I have prepared a nine point plan. So I'm gonna start here with a little story um, from a friend of mine who told me that there's a saying that um, good far bad farmers grow weeds, good farmers grow crops, great farmers grow soil. And that's a very deep teaching. What is the soil in us that we are cultivating in general? And what is the soil in us that we are cultivating if we know that we might be going into a situation in which another person could get triggered. Maybe it's a, it's a particular kind of interaction that you know is often tense for that other person. Maybe it's challenging for them. It could be a relationship in which the other person just gets triggered a lot, or maybe they get triggered around you, or maybe they want to, or they seem to want to get triggered around you in an accusatory, angry, fault-finding, critical kind of way. Whatever it might be, sometimes, often we're sort of shocked or startled by something that bubbles up. On the other hand, many times we can kind of predict what's actually going to happen, uh, including because relationships and interactions tend to follow scripts that are familiar to both parties. And so understanding the script of what typically happens, the storyline with that other person, aha, you can have a sense of, well, I better be prepared for this. And one of the things that I think is really important to appreciate is that if we get triggered when they're triggered, we cannot help either of us. We cannot help ourselves. We, not, we cannot help them. And the Buddha was very clear about enlightened self-interest, that it's really okay to focus on your own practice and your own rights and needs, ultimately inclusive of the sake of others, but certainly you have rights yourself. And I love this kind of classic teaching in the Buddhist tradition. If one going down a river, swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away, how can one help others across? So that's my first suggestion here for what to do when others get triggered. I'll go through these nine suggestions, and then hopefully there'll be some good time for discussion. Second, when you recognize that, oh, they are triggered, <laughs> they are, be mindful of your reactions to that. We can have all kinds of reactions to other people when they get intense or irritated or even subtly so. Suddenly they start giving us a long lecture and it all sounds so rational, right? But you can tell that behind it, there's an edge. Something has happened for them. And so when others are reactivated, when they get emotional, because we're enormously social, we are designed to be affected by the feelings, the attitudes, and even the behaviors of others. Because when others get triggered, sometimes they do things. They start pointing at us, or their voice rises, or they lean in, or they get big and, and scary. Uh, whatever they might do, be aware of your own reactions to that. They're not bad. They're not good. They're just your reactions. Try to be mindful of them and appreciate how your reactions could be turbocharged, could be shaped by your temperament, something I talked about during the informal um, beginning here before 6 p.m. Pacific time. Um, you know, we all have different temperaments. 
Uh, sometimes people err on the side of stepping back too much. That's based on their history or their temperament. Other people err on the side of pushing forward too fast, too intensely when others are triggered based on their history or temperament. So try to know something about yourself and why your reactions might be arising, maybe having to do with your history with the person or your history in general. Mindfulness alone gives us a kind of shock absorber, gives us a kind of spaciousness in which we can be aware of what we're feeling. We're not pushing it down. We're not fighting it. We're aware of it without being carried away by it down that swollen, swiftly flowing river. Okay? okay. Then third, protect yourself and others as need be. It's understandable if there's a sense of initially being overwhelmed uh, or freezing. And this is especially understandable if you've had a history in which you were traumatized or bullied or attacked by powerful forces, or you've lived in a way in which society structurally, systematically is oppressive, you know, like a current, speaking of the swollen flowing river, that you have to swim against every day. So it's understandable if, you know, initially there's a kind of like, you know, shock, sometimes having to do with, you just can't believe they're saying that or doing that. or you, And you can't believe that other people standing there are not helping in reasonable and just ways. You're like, what? Uh, I've had situations with you know, some people in my life where I did not see that coming. You know, I'm fairly alert. <laughs> like, what's going on? Did not see that one coming. So it's understandable if we feel initially shocked or helpless, you know, we freeze. And I think it's important to keep doing what we can to find a sense of agency, if only inside our own mind, you know, to try to keep thinking, to stay in the game, as it were, to stay engaged. Or um, what I mean is to stay engaged mentally, you may need to disengage physically and behaviorally and emotionally, but you can do that in a way in which there's a sense of being on your own side, knowing what you're doing and acting in your own best interest and that of others you care about. Uh, as you can see in the chat, there's this quotation in the Dhammapada that I'm very fond of. You've heard me say it before. One is not wise because one speaks much. One is truly wise, who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless. And with all the kind of touchy-feely talk about compassion and loving kindness, all of which is great, there is a part of the truth and there is a part of the Dharma that is about a kind of strength and clarity. Even if there is some fear flowing around the edges in the core of your being, uh, there is courage and a courage that can help you protect yourself and others. Part of that protection, and that protection may take many forms. It might take, it might take the form of asking the person to slow down or to step back or to quit sticking their fist under your face. You know? It might take the form of quietly observing without committing yourself, getting out of the situation as fast as you can, and then figuring out what to do, which might involve, you know, calling someone to help, you know, uh, you do it, you know, take action, protect yourself as you need to from people who are triggered. Sometimes all you need to do is protect your mind. They're not a physical threat in the moment. They're not going to, um, you know, attack you uh, physically. They're just upset. And maybe there's you know, something in that that's about you. In that sense, you can have a kind of spaciousness. You can stay present with them physically, but inside your own mind, you can keep deciding what you truly uh, believe and what you truly value and truly are going to do. That's what I mean by agency. It's a fancy term. It kind of means being active rather than passive, uh, 
being a little more like a hammer than a nail. I don't mean that in an aggressive sense. It, feeling more like you're a cause rather than a fact, or feeling like you're whole, you're pr you're protecting a, a kind of inherent freedom deep inside, in, in how you look at things and and what you plan to do. Uh, you know, Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, talked about preserving that important freedom deep down inside us to uh, choose for ourselves how we will respond. That's what that word agency means, the sense of continuing to focus on where you can make choices, if only inside your own mind with what you think and, and, and what you decide to do. So, um, you know, like I said, we can protect our mind. We just don't have to go into agreement with other people necessarily, even if they're intense and powerful and loud and demanding. Uh, protect your mind. Uh, that's one of the things that understandably gets lost in, in some families. It's It feels like, oh, I, I have to be obedient or compliant, or I have to, you know, lose my authenticity in order to maintain attachment. Uh, Gabor Mate, wonderful uh, teacher, physician, trauma expert, uh, you know, developing lots and lots of wonderful material, talks about the conflict in childhood and, and also sometimes in adult relationships between authenticity and attachment. You know, do I have to lose me to maintain a sense of we? And for children especially, uh, it's absolutely crucial to maintain some sense of attachment. So understandably, kids learn to put on a certain face or to act a certain way to continue to maintain attachments with important others. So understandably, these reactions can still be present here and um, can make us feel like, oh, we have to go into agreement or alignment with others. We have to give them approval, especially if they're pulling for approval. Um, maybe outwardly, we have to act polite. We have to maybe give them something just to enable ourselves to get out of the situation, especially if the stakes are high. But inside your own mind, you never have to bow down to anyone, fundamentally. Inside your own mind, you never have to dance to anyone's tune if you do not want to. Very important. That's number three. Then, number four, try to find compassion for them, of course, along with compassion for yourself. And there's some beautiful quotations here. Um, you know, before I introduce, well, to start here, uh, Maureen Connor, a uh, deep practitioner, was quoted in Buddha Dharma some years ago, and I was just so struck by what she said and the heart in it. As the earth gives us food and air and all the things we need, I give my heart to caring for all others until all attain awakening. For the good of all sentient beings, May loving kindness be born in me. You can just feel the sweetness of that aspiration and the boundlessness of it. It's an aspiration. It's a work in progress. Uh, and still we can be really touched in that way. To be clear, a recognition of the suffering of others and a fundamental stance of benevolence rather than hatred toward others is not agreement. Compassion is not agreement or approval or a waiving of your own rights. We can disagree strongly and oppose strongly others who are harming us or others while still recognizing our common humanity, that they too suffer. And we can wish that they not suffer so much while still seeking justice, while still opposing them fiercely. And recognizing this distinction actually fosters compassion because we it creates more space. It creates a kind of infinite space of freedom in which we are, are not bound to the contingencies or the conditions of others to, uh, in, to, to practice increasingly a kind of radiance of compassion that extends in all directions 
through which all beings, not just human beings, all beings, including non-human animals, pass, irrespective of any conditions. It's unconditional compassion extending in all directions. Now, that is a high bar to maintain that all the time for everyone. Uh, I'm still working on it myself, uh, especially the all the time part. Um, and, uh, you know, still, it's aspirational, right? Really, it's, it's good. And much research shows, actually, that finding compassion for others helps us center and calm and not get burned out because compassion itself has a warm-heartedness in it that tends to protect us and nurture us even as it flows through us. You can feel the aspiration as well in this last quotation here. With goodwill for the entire cosmos, cultivate a limitless heart, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hostility or hate. So that's that suggestion. And sometimes we need to step out of a situation. You know, the old line, fences make for good neighbors. Sometimes we need to step out of a situation to be able to find compassion for people. We need to get a little breathing room so we're not so flooded by their intensity. And so, you know, there's a term in developmental psychology, distance in the service of attachment. Sometimes we need to step back to enable our heart to step in and you may need to do that. Then the next one, <clears throat> be helpful as appropriate. You know, maybe they're not at all triggered about you. Maybe they're just tired and they need a break or they, they don't understand something or they need some help with their computer. Uh, I can think about times I've been triggered with my computer and my, my kids who are more facile with something came in and fixed it. Thank you. <laughs> That's what they did when I was triggered, right? They helped me. Uh, you know, sometimes people just need a break. Maybe they need a break from talking with you because it's too much for right now. Or um, it's hard for them just to be with you for some reason, maybe having to do with they're comparing themselves to you or something else is happening. You know, maybe we can be helpful. Maybe, you know, we can give them a lift or uh, just promise that will help them solve that problem or help them find a resource. Or, uh, you know, after just hearing them out, maybe that's the best thing we can do. Just give them their time to hear them out, you know, as we can. Grounded in compassion, you know, be helpful as best we can to them. Sometimes that um, being helpful in the present can repair a lot of breakdowns from the past. This doesn't mean being pushed around or bullied by other people. It doesn't mean placating them or appeasing them, you know, to just make them go away. I'm, I'm talking about a sincerity of helpfulness here. Uh, great. Then number six, what do we do if they're triggered about you, by you? This is where I have found for myself, it really is helpful to kind of try to sort things out into three piles. So this may be familiar to some of you who have heard me talk about this or you've seen me write about this. And um, initially, if someone is triggered by you or about you, often their response has a kind of attack in it or a complaint. Maybe it's a soft, hurt reproach. Maybe it's uh, an angry grievance, it could be a demand, it could be based on their version of events, uh, including maybe things you did not know about. Maybe you had an impact on them that was not your intent, but understandably, it had that kind of, it landed on them in that kind of way. All kinds of stuff is coming at you when others are triggered, if it's about you, right? What do we do? I find it so helpful. This is part of agency, part of making choices and, and feeling like a chooser who can make choices, if only inside your own mind, to sort it out into, okay, what if anything was a moral fault on my part that 
I, in which I was out of integrity or I did a really bad thing or I crossed some kind of line, I violated my own code in an important way uh, that you decide is actually a moral fault that's worthy of some remorse maybe, okay? Maybe some guilt. Second, what is not a matter of a moral fault but does call for some skillful correction? It's not that you did a bad thing or were bad yourself. It's just, uh-huh, I could be more skillful next time, and I'm going to try to be more skillful next time. I, I, or I've learned something here, and I will be more skillful next time. I'm going to put in some correction going forward. Or third, it could just be, you, you know, not, it, not a matter of a moral fault or even unskillfulness. Just they have a different preference than you. And going forward, if you choose, you can give them what I call a gracious gift. You can just go, okay, you know, our, our daughter hates the smell of mayonnaise. So <laughs> I'm a little cautious about opening the jar on the table right next to her. No big deal. Uh, okay. Now, very often what happens is other people come at us with a lot of topspin, a lot of heat, a lot of moral accusation. Uh, when in fact, when we look at it, we didn't really do anything wrong. Yeah, and next time we could be more skillful or, or um, you know, we can maybe fix something or, you know, lesson learned. No big deal. We can decide ourselves to implement that skillful correction without agreeing with the moral accusation and without taking on board any shame or guilt or remorse. Knowing that we can make skillful corrections or offer people gracious gifts without taking on board any um, shame or guilt or remorse that we feel is undeserved actually opens up a space, again, of freedom, of choice, in which we can be responsive to others. We can be more responsive to others when we know that we do not have to assume any guilt if in our heart of hearts, in our mind, we don't feel we deserve it. Now, sometimes what's appropriate is other people are still going at you. You are bad, you did bad, you ought to feel ashamed of yourself. And without getting into a big war about that with them, we just take on board, oh, okay, next time I'm gonna do something differently. We might even tell them we're gonna act differently in the future and they might say, oh, I don't know, I can never trust you, approve it. I'm like, I'm not gonna approve it, I'm just gonna do it and you'll see what I do. I've said a lot about uh, this way of you know, responding, sorting into three piles and so forth. I'm not going to get into um, it in a lot of detail, but I just want to name this as an option. It's one of the most useful things, honestly, that I kind of learned for myself along the way in my own relationships, and it's helped me immensely. And I, you know, I find amusement and um, self-respect, frankly, in finding and discerning how quickly can I respond to some complaint or grievance coming at me and identify what I could do differently going forward. Uh, and addressing that, uh, implementing the correction and moving on, you know, it's, it's kind of fun in a funny kind of way. Uh, it reframes what to do when, when people are really coming at you. Okay. Okay. So next one, seven. Keep being clear about your own priorities. Keep your eyes on the prize. What are the stakes? It might be that the stakes on the table are to get through an awkward interaction in which you're kind of stuck, you know, next to someone on a, in an airplane or at a dinner or in a meeting and phew, getting out of there as fast as you can and never going back. You know, maybe that's your priority. Maybe it's your priority with this person to stand up for yourself because you've just kind of had it with this repetitive pattern of them getting triggered and blaming you for their trigger. Uh, as I've quoted my friend Daniel Ellenberg, um, he has a saying sometimes with you know, regard to others, uh, we can be responsible for the ways that we have bumped into other people's red buttons that trigger them but we are not responsible for installing those buttons in that person's history. And so sometimes, 
you know, you'll decide that your priority is to confront the person and say, look, you know, I'm just not responsible for you being upset here. I want to help, you know, I want to be a good person. I want to do the right thing. I want to be helpful in appropriate ways, but I'm, you are responsible for your own reactions here. You are, you are constructing them inside your own mind. Now that can be often pretty annoying to hear. So you might want to wait until they're calmer before you go down that road. But at a certain point, sometimes you just draw a boundary. Maybe that's your priority. Or maybe your priority, uh, first and foremost, is to take a certain amount of heat yourself while you're protecting others. Maybe that's your priority. Being clear about priorities is very useful and focused on you know, what am I trying to accomplish here immediately in this interaction while this person is triggered? What am I trying to accomplish in the next day or, or, or week? What am I trying to accomplish in general, depending on the situation? Maybe it's a business environment, a work setting where they're triggered and other people are watching. How are you going to respond? Right? So you're taking that into account. Maybe it's a family situation and, um, you know, Maybe there are people in the room who don't realize why this other person is triggered, but you understand why they're triggered and you want to be an ally to them. Maybe that's your priority uh, in that situation. And also, of course, what's your priority in terms of your personal practice? Sometimes we get so startled by something, we stop practicing with it. But within a few breaths, within a few hours, hopefully, at least, we can start to practice with it. And then in terms of practice, what are your values? You know, in practice, non-harming, compassion, uh, learning, uh, the cultivation of wisdom, the, the recognition, insight into the nature of all experiences as made of parts that are connected and changing, and thus foamy and insubstantial, cloud-like, even as they pass through awareness. You know, what, what's your practice? And a fundamental practice seen around the world and certainly in the Buddhist tradition is equanimity. So there's some beautiful quotations here. First, if by renouncing a lesser happiness, one may realize a greater happiness, let the wise one renounce the lesser, having regard for the greater. What that can mean in pr actual practice is that you might realize, you know, this person is triggered. I so want to make this intense, righteous point. I so want to tell them why they're wrong. You know, I so want to pound on my political drum, right, left, center, up or down. But you know, that is the lesser happiness, to be right, to prove my point. You know, that's the lesser happiness. The greater happiness is to see the greater good, to see the bigger picture, and to, you know, maintain a kind of core inside myself of calm well-being so that later on I can enjoy what's called the bliss of blamelessness. Yes, I might have gotten kind of stirred up, but I stayed inside the lines. You know, I stayed in my lane of my own integrity, my own code, and I did not do something that I'm going to regret later. You know, that's the greater happiness, perhaps. And then in terms of equanimity, there's some lovely metaphors here. Um, whose mind is like rock, steady, unmoved, dispassionate uh, for things that spark passion, unangered, by things that spark anger, not suppressing passion and anger, allowing it to appear, but not to be invaded by it. When one's mind is developed like this, so that passion or anger or other reactions do not invade us and remain, from where can there come suffering and stress? This goes to what I was saying during the meditation, that we can rest in and, in effect, identify with and abide as a field that is itself stable, spacious, and not itself shaken, through which shaky things can pass. But in the core of our being, we're finding that fundamental peacefulness that is warm-hearted and content in the present. 
And that's a, a matter of cultivation over time, which involves over time changing literally the structure and function of parts of your own brain. Then something I try to remember, you know, in the Dhammapada, there are those who do not realize that one day we all must die. But those who do realize this settle their quarrels. Now, sometimes you cannot stop another person from quarreling with you, but you can disengage yourself from the quarrel. The quarrel, it still means you can seek justice. You can stand up for others and stand up for yourself, but not in a contentious way, not in a way that is stuck, tangled. You know, the Buddha really talked about being tangled and stuck as a fundamental source of suffering. The opportunity then is to become disentangled disentangle the threads of our knotted reactions and to develop a greater ground or field of freedom, of spaciousness, in which we can observe what's happening without being implicated by it or, or conditioned by it or hijacked by it. Knowing that the other person is angry, one who remains mindful and calm acts for one's own best interest and for the other's interest to. Someone asks, where can you find things that I've written about it? Um, in the book Resilient, uh, there's a lot of really good material, the, that book that I wrote with our son Forrest, uh, about dealing with interpersonal issues in a resilient way on a foundation of intimacy in, in a broad sense of you know, connection with others. And uh, that can involve in the chapter on courage, uh, skillful assertiveness, compassionate assertiveness in ways that are skillful. I should add now, other people have written well about this. I'm very fond of Oren's, Oren, Sofer, Oren J. Sofer's book, um, Say What You Mean, uh, which involves a great summary uh, or an application of um, um, nonviolent communication, quote unquote, from Marshall Rosenberg. And uh, you know, there are other books too, but if you're interested in things I've written, also in my programs, um, I did a, I have an online program called The Strong Heart, really go into detail there. That might be the best place actually to find a lot of good material there. Uh, you can find that program, The Strong Heart, on our website. Okay? Okay, great. I think it's helpful to be especially mindful of anger. You know, anger with its poisoned root and honey, you know, it's, what is it? Honeyed sting, honeyed tip, and poisoned barb. That's a metaphor. Another one here is poisoned root and sweet sting. Anger is normal. And especially if you've had your anger suppressed or shamed or dismissed or uh, marginalized or trivialized uh, by others, you know, including based on you know, societal structures, it's especially important to claim anger and honor it and, and not let people tell you that, oh, you don't need to be angry. Uh, why are you so angry? You know, yeah, well, I'm angry because you're a jerk, actually. You know, that's why I'm angry. <laughs> There's a good reason why I'm angry. And you've been messing with me for a long time and messing with people like me for generations now, and I've had it up to here. Okay. And anger, it's, you know, creates a lot of suffering and can create a lot of suffering and harm for ourselves and others. So be careful. Careful. Care in the sense of conscientiousness and diligent benevolence. You know, both of those together with regard to your own anger. Be careful, be careful with anger. I'm gonna try to finish up here now with <clears throat> my favorite part of all of this, which is to recognize the big, big picture. Number nine. They're triggered, things are happening, people are watching, there could be a lot of consequences. You're having reactions to their reactions, to your reactions, to their reactions. A lot is happening. And in our practice, in our practice, maybe after the dust settles sometimes, because sometimes unless you're really, you know, you've got your solid game here, uh, you know, it's hard to do this in the moment. 
But as soon as possible, see if you can recognize the big, really big picture. Mathieu Ricard, profound practitioner, um, says here, one should learn to let thoughts arise and be freed to go as soon as they arise, instead of letting them invade one's mind. In the freshness of the present moment, the past is gone. The future is not born. And if one remains in pure mindfulness and freedom, potentially disturbing thoughts arise and go without leaving a trace. This is a development. This is a practice. We can increasingly develop it. And as Gil Fronstel put it extremely usefully, I'm going to paraphrase slightly, the purpose of practice is to expand the range of experiences in which we are free. Right? In our practice, we develop the capacity to rest in the way Mathieu Ricard is talking about here in increasingly challenging um, and intense situations, including when others are triggered. Um, it's a practice. We develop this over time. Also, from the Zen tradition, Wu Men Hui Kai, this is a particular translation, flowers in springtime, moon in autumn, cool wind in summer, snow in winter. If you don't make anything in your mind, for you, it is a good season. I just love that teaching, you know? It's great, right? Yeah, seasons come, seasons go, and things passing through. But if we're not constructing or fabricating, is a nice translation from the Buddha Dharma, fabricating with the implications of it, the connotations of that. If we're not fabricating, we're not making stuff up in our own minds. We're seeing clearly. We're still functioning. We're making choices. We have agency, as I've said. But basically, more and more, we're not... In the big picture, we're, we don't have to make things up in our minds. It's always a good season, right? I'm reminded of the saying that from the, I think that Northeast in America, I don't know where it came from. There's no such thing as bad weather. There's only bad clothing <laughs> or bad equipment or bad gear. And what I mean by that is that when we increasingly have this kind of spaciousness that's stable, you know, the weather patterns can come and go, uh, but they don't need to invade and remain. Pema Chodron has a kind of relevant saying about that. She says, you are the sky. Everything else is just the weather. And then last, wow, what a quotation from Long Chen Pa. It's a deep teaching. Since everything is but an experience, perfect in being what it is, having nothing to do with good or bad, acceptance or rejection, one may well burst out in laughter. Now, this is an insight into the fundamental nature of experiences and really the nature of all phenomena. In the larger context of that insight, clearly there's a place for moral judgment, for recognizing that some things are harmful, some things are helpful, there's a place for acquiring greater skill, for having values. And underneath all that, in a very fundamental kind of more radical sense, things are just what they are. In the universe, which includes mental phenomena as well as material phenomena, things are just what they are. And we can kind of get that. And we just sort of get it. Anger my anger, anger this, my sadness that, their anger this, their sadness that, the gopher, the galaxy, everything is just one tissue, one reality. Ha, ha, ha! You start like, what? You know, it doesn't mean derisive or dismissive or disdainful. It's no pushing away. It's not a spiritual bypass. It's a kind of Of freedom. And that's what Long Chen Pa is talking about. I hope this wasn't too much. Whew. Let's take a breath. I kind of gave you the fire hose here. 
<laughs> uh, I think next week, I'm let's we'll just we'll just talk about all this and kind of have a recap of what to do when you're triggered, what to do when they're triggered, what to do when we're triggered. I think what I want to say is that for all the complexity and stuff I've offered, I can tell you, for me, there's some basics that really help. When they're triggered, try to slow it down and try to be open rather than contracted, free instead of pressured. Now, to do that, sometimes you have to take practical actions immediately. But as much as possible, when they're triggered, I just find it so helpful, unless there's an urgent emergency, to slow it down, to lean in, not away, and to listen and to try to find out what has happened here. With an attitude of respect, patience, dignity, stability, just that alone will help you feel better and could have a beneficial effect on the other person. Really fundamental. I find it is also helpful to err on the side of graciousness and generosity with self-respect. And often we can afford to be gracious, to be generous, to to allow that the other person their upset. Part of graciousness is just acceptance and spaciousness, you know, the gift of spaciousness for that other person. We don't have to resist what they're saying often in the moment. We don't have to take it on board either. That can actually be really good. And then, you know, figuring out what to do, figuring out what to do. So when they're triggered, finding a centering, a grounding, a calming in yourself as appropriate, finding a compassionate receptivity and graciousness, and then, very importantly, with an inner freedom and self-respect, not letting yourself be pushed around, at least inside your own mind, sorting out what's appropriate to do in the moment and then over the longer term. You know, we do the best we can. So I want to thank you for receiving what I've offered here. I will go back and read all the comments that have come through the chat that I didn't have time to see. You can know that I've received it. And you can also know that I appreciate you and respect you and respect you for your practice. In this world, there's not a lot of practice a lot of the time in a lot of the people. And so people who do have a practice and who can support practice and others as well, wow, what a gift, what a necessary gift in this world. So I thank you for your practice. And that is our formal ending. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.